continuing production of The Open Mind has been made possible by grants from the Rosalind P. Walter Foundation, the Bluestein Family Foundation, the Joan Gans Cooney and Peter G. Peterson Fund, Carnegie Corporation of New York, the Malkin Fund, the May and Samuel Rudin Family Foundation, the Joanne and Kenneth Wellner Foundation, the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, and from the corporate community, Mutual of America. I'm Richard Hefner, your host on The Open Mind. And as he was last time, my guest today, again, is journalist Andrew Ross Sorkin, a financial columnist for The New York Times, its chief mergers and acquisitions reporter, and the founding editor of DealBook, an online daily financial report published by The Times, for which he also writes a weekly column of the same name. Now, Mr. Sorkin's expertise also has him appearing quite frequently on our television screens, particularly as he co-anchors CNBC's morning Squawk Box. And his now updated Penguin book about this nation's near catastrophic banking crisis at the end of the Bush administration, Too Big to Fail, has become an American classic. With its subtitle, The Inside Story of how Wall Street and Washington fought to save the financial system and themselves. Too Big to Fail has, of course, been parodied over and over again as Too Big to Jail. But last time, our initial focus was on whether many giant American corporations, not just our banks and other financial institutions, might not be considered themselves too big to fail or to jail given the damage their failing jailing might do to our economy generally. And I'd like to carry on today from where we stopped last time. Thank you for having me back. Andrew, it's good to have you here because I want to keep pressing you. What about Dodd-Frank? Dodd-Frank. Dodd-Frank has done, um, I would say this, Dodd-Frank is, is, is has been very helpful around the edges, but it doesn't solve the ultimate problem that we were describing and discussing in the last uh, program, which is, do we want banks that are too big to fail? Um, and have we solved the problem? Um, you know, uh, Barney Frank would tell you, and Tim Geithner would tell you, and Chris Dodd would tell you, that the regulation that was put into place ends too big to fail forever. There is a provision in, in that legislation that effectively allows the government to take over a failing institution, much like the way the FDIC would, and shareholders are on the hook, everybody gets thrown out, the, the, the top management gets thrown out, and the idea is that, that they're able to put it into a form of conservatorship uh, such that it doesn't create this kind of domino effect um, that the failure of Lehman Brothers created. It's called financial resolution, resolution authority, rather. Um, and that provision's there. Resolution authority exists in the legislation. My worry is that if and when we have a problem, we're not going to have the guts to use it. Let me explain. The next time we have a true financial crisis, the next time we think one of our big banks, and again, you can name the bank, Bank of America or J.P. Morgan or Morgan Stanley or whomever, is on the precipice. And there's going to be a public outcry. The markets are going to be falling like crazy. Uh, the Wall Street lobbyists uh, and uh, everybody else are going to be on the phones to Washington saying, uh, you know, what are you going to do about this? And there's going to be some people who are going to say, well, we have this provision. We're, we're just going to enact what we said we were going to do. We're not going to bail them out. We're going to let them go. What I worry is going to happen 
is that people are going to say, you know what, we've never done this before. We've never tried this. We don't know if this is actually going to work in practice. And then what? And by the way, resolution authority works if we're talking about one bank, maybe about two. But if we're really in trouble, the reason these banks are probably going to be in trouble in the first place is because all of them are in trouble. And that's when it's going to become very difficult. But isn't Dodd-Frank designed to prevent the things, to prevent the things that make for ultimately yes. failure? Yes, and, 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 and that's where I think ultimately it helps, but again, helps around the margins. The Volcker Rule helps, but it, it isn't Glass-Steagall. It isn't. It helps around the margins. We still haven't figured out what we're doing with derivatives in a meaningful way. Again, helps around the margins. We haven't got there yet. Um, compensation helps around the margins. We haven't got there yet. Um, an issue, by the way, that's complicated and that is a very popular issue to talk about, but I'm, never, I'm not sure, by the way, on comp, just as a complete side note, that we're ever going to truly figure out how to regulate that. Compensation. How to regulate compensation uh, to make sure that people are incentivized, um, not just incentivized properly, but that therefore they, they make the right decision. And, and the reason I say that is every time I think about compensation, um, I think about, I actually think about Dick Fold, former CEO of Lehman Brothers. And the reason I think about Dick Fold is that Dick Fold had a billion dollars of stock in his company. Billion dollars. He had, quote unquote, more skin in the game than just about anybody else. This is what we say we want all of our executives to have. We want skin in the game. He rode his billion dollars of stock all the way down to $56,000. He had a billion dollars of skin in the game, rode it down to $56,000. What does that say about our ability to regulate and in therefore incentivize and motivate people to make the right decisions. My view, frankly, is that the, the people at the very top of these institutions, who, by the way, traditionally made a lot of money already, they're not motivated. The, the mo they're motivated by money, but the, it's not really about the money. It, the money is a scorecard. It's about pride. It's about power. It's about all sorts of other things that are much more complicated than simply saying, we're going to take away the money. The other thing that's, that, that makes this uh, even more complicated on, on, on the compensation, I'm sorry to go on a tangent, is when I think about Dick Fold, the objective journalist in me wants to tell you there's another side of the story, which is, as I said, he's taken a lot of money out of the company. So over his 39-year career, he took probably almost $200 million out of the company. So on one side, you could say he had a billion dollars of, of skin in the game. On the other side, you could say, you know what, he had $200 million. That's a great cushion. That cushion allows you to take remarkable risk. That billion dollars of stock wasn't skin in the game, it was the cherry on top. Now, if that's true, we have another problem. Because most of the leaders of not just financial institutions in the United States, but the CEOs of most major companies have made a good amount of money that they've been able to take off the table over the years, which therefore would then allow them to take remarkable risk. So, uh, you know, again, I think there's lots of things we've done on the regulatory side that help. The Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, for example, I think that should actually simplify a lot of things. A lot of the, the horrible uh, robo-signing uh, things that went on in the mortgage market, that gets cleaned up. So all of that's good. But when you think about the financial crisis and what really got us here, it's ultimately about leverage and debt in the system. And ultimately, Dodd-Frank doesn't doesn't regulate how much, how, you know, what the leverage ratio is that, that, that a bank can manage. That's something that the Federal Reserve is trying to deal with by increasing capital requirements and the like. But if Dodd-Frank becomes effective, and by the way, my understanding from reading the New York Times right. is that so many things have happened uh, to prevent it from becoming Oh, and, that, and that's the other problem. I mean, Dodd-Frank, in truth, we, have, we haven't really been able to study or even ascertain what the impact of Dodd-Frank is because we are now five, we're coming up on five years after the crisis. Dodd-Frank is not really in motion. I mean, it's in motion, but it's not, it's not there. And by the way, there is going to be a two or three or four year period when everything finally uh, is, is implemented. And even during that period, there's going to be tweaking and changing and all sorts of things. And so there's going to be a, a decade 
where, you know, to the extent that, 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 that Wall Street's frustrated by regulation and what's going on, this is going to go on for another decade because even once we've implemented Dodd-Frank, then they're going to come back and decide, you know what, this works. And by the way, maybe this doesn't work. And by the way, that also happened uh, after, after the Great Depression as well. There were all sorts of rules that we put in place, but it took us a good 10 years to figure out what was good and what wasn't. You talk about putting it uh, in place. Right. It would seem to be many efforts being made now to prevent it. Correct. At least the essence of Dodd Frank from ever, ever, ever going into play. Well, I think the 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 there are two big components of Dodd Frank, which have not been implemented yet. The biggest being vo the Volcker Rule. Um, you could argue that in practice, uh, many of the banks are already operating uh, in Under some ways with the intention or expectation the Volcker Rule is coming. And, and what I mean by that is, you, if you go look at uh, a Goldman Sachs, for example. Uh, you know, they had a, a, an arbitrage desk. That arbitrage desk doesn't exist anymore. They've all moved over. But, and by the way, worry about this for next time. That desk, they're not at Goldman Sachs anymore, so maybe you think that's the good news. They just went uptown to 57th Street. They're up at KKR now, uh, uh, Kravis Kohlberg Roberts. So, you know, the other thing that's happened uh, in light of all of uh, this regulation is frankly the fact that we've moved to a, what they call a shadow banking system. So to the extent there are risks in the system, they're not actually at the big regulated banks, they're now off in, off in the corners. And I'm not saying that's, that's better or worse, it may be better in, in regard to the fact that they're now at smaller institutions. We go talk about big versus small and what, what, what that means, but um, there's a lot going on here. You're talking about poison. You're talking about poisonous attitudes, poisonous institutions. You're talking about I think, near fatal poisons. Mm -hmm. What do we do? Uh, what did we do or what do no, we do? No, what do we do? Uh, number one, do you think mm -hmm. we're aware as a, of, as a people of the things that you're talking about? No, I think, I, I think the, the financial literacy in this country and, and some of these concepts, and I have tried, given, given uh, that I'm hoping to try to be able to communicate to this audience about what what's going on. You know, if you talk to, if you talk to most people about Dodd Frank, they wouldn't really be able to tell you what is in Dodd Frank. If you ask them what the Volcker Rule is on mass, most people, sadly, my name I haven't been able to tell you who Paul Volcker is, even though they probably should. Um, I think that we need to figure out a way to get the banking system, and I think I said this in the last broadcast. We need to get the banking system to be the backroom engine for the economy. We need to get the, the banking business um, to really feel that their job is truly to service the client, whether it's you walking in off the street or a big company, not about servicing themselves. It became a business about fees. It became a competition among each other about how much money they could make. And part of that is a function, frankly, of the short-term nature of the stock market and the short-term nature of investors and the short-term nature of this country. You know, for all of the blame, we've, we've had a big conversation here about the banks, and, and, and I think we've blamed the banks uh, for a lot of this. And by the way, pick your poison. I mean, you pick your villain. You could decide, obviously, the credit rating agencies or, or, or Fannie and Freddie or housing policy or Alan Greenspan or whomever is your, your villain. The banks obviously get a, a lot of it. One of the things that I worry about is we never sit around and say, maybe we were at fault. Tell me what you mean. We, the we. capitalist system, the capitalist mentality. Um, I would say we, I don't know if it's capitalism per se as it is short-termism. You know, we often talk today about how we, how, how the financial crisis was a function of short-term thinking. It was about CEOs and boards and managements who were trying to jack up their stock as quickly as humanly possible. They were trying to take as much profits off the table uh, so that they could show their shareholders that they were doing the right thing. Um, and that wasn't the right thing. And we often say, by the way, increasingly we say we want more shareholder democracy, which is actually quite interesting because we say we want the shareholders, we want to have a seat at the table because we think that we're long-term thinkers. Are we really long-term thinkers? Are shareholders really long-term thinkers? When you look at the volume, at the end of the day, the New York Stock Exchange, you turn CNBC on or your local TV, 
70% of that volume where the New York Stock Exchange, that's a computer that's done that. That's not a person. The average uh, investment portfolio, the professional investment portfolio, you might have your money at Vanguard or a 401k plan or whatever. They turn over their portfolio every 12 months. If you're a CEO, who is your shareholder? They're a shareholder for, for, for less than 12 months. So, you know, I would argue at some level, we're getting exactly what we're paying for, which I is- I thought you were gonna say we're getting exactly what we deserve. Well, may, maybe. I, um, what else could it be? Well, I think You're that talking it, about our national attitudes. I think our, and by the way, you could, I, I, would, I would go so far as to suggest that our attitude about uh, that, that I'm talking about in the corporate financial sphere is true of the way we think about Washington and the way we think about it, so many things. We want results. Uh, we're a very result-oriented uh, uh, country, and, and, and that leads in some cases to great results, but it also leads to poor results. And when I think about what's happened in the banking system, I can't, I can't help but think a little bit. Um, and this isn't about blaming uh, you know, the, the person who, who, who borrowed uh, too much for a house that they, they, they shouldn't have bought Why in the not? bank a lot. Why isn't no, it? No, it is. I mean, at some level it is. That's part of it. But I think that to the extent we got ourselves in this position and you think culturally about the way the, the banking system and corporations writ large work, it's about meeting that quarterly profit number. It's about are we beating the number? The expectation is X. We need to get there. Are we going to make an investment for, that's, that's going to cost us now, that's going to reap benefits five years from now? It's very hard for companies to make those decisions uh, because they then feel the wrath of the, the, uh, uh, the shareholders who call up and say, you know what, we're kicking out of your job. You know, this isn't, again, not to sympathize with the CEO who, who's, by the way, making, uh, you know, a lot of money. But when you really try to understand the incentive structure around this system that we've created, it creates, in some cases, some really wonderful innovations and, and amazing things happen in this country, but it also has some perverse incentives as well. You mentioned the ratings. Uh, agencies. Before, the agencies. Most conflicted business in the world. Most conflicted business in the world. What business do you know where you rate me and I pay you? It'd be like I'd go into the courtroom downtown on Pearl Street, I'd pay the judge money, and I'd say, make a ruling. Does that make any sense to well, anybody? You think it's not unknown, but uh, it's a pattern that we followed for a long time, isn't it? Well, I will tell you. So, you know, I can sit here and tell you this makes no sense. On its face, it makes no sense. Underneath, it where You could look everywhere. It doesn't make any sense. However, you mm -hmm. could also sit around and have real conversations with very thoughtful, smart people in the business world, in academia, in government, and say, okay, how do we fix it? What's the best way to do it? Should the users pay? You'd, you'd think, by the way, the investors should pay for the rating, because what's happening here ultimately is we're rating a company's debt, for example, and the people who should care about the rating are the investors, they should pay. Well, if I told you that Investor A has a lot of money and he can afford to pay to find out what Moody's is charging or what, what, Moody's, is, what Moody's rating is, but Investor B doesn't get, doesn't get the same access to that information, it creates a whole other series of problems. So it's not, the problem is it's not very, very simple uh, and there's not a simple fix. There have been some very interesting progressive uh, proposals put forward uh, that, uh, that I found interesting. The most interesting one is the idea of, of, of creating an agency that's either related to or part of the SEC that effectively contracts out to the rating agencies. So if you're Ford and you want your debt rated, you call up the SEC, you say, I need to get my debt rated. You're going to pay a flat fee effectively to the SEC, and then they will outsource it to uh, four or five of these firms. Are you concerned that it's a government agency? I don't know. I'm a little, I'm a little concerned about that. Why? Um, traditionally, I think, uh, traditionally, I've been led to believe that, that, that money seems to do better in private hands than, 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 than public hands. That, maybe that's just a, 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 my, my, my leaning or my bias. Um, I don't know if it would work 
I don't know what happens to the rating, and then I really don't know what happens if, if something really bad happens, meaning if the ratings are all wrong again, and the ratings are done effectively this time by the government, then we have a whole <laughs> other problem on our hands. And, and so, I, I, again, uh, you know, we're having a great nuanced conversation, but these issues are so complicated, they're never black and white, a, a, as much as I wish they were. It would make, uh, make for easier writing. Yeah, but uh, I'm not asking you right. questions that require black and white answers in a sense you must have a you must have a picture of where we are who we are and what we've got to do or what yeah. we've got not to do no look look you had asked and i think in the last broadcast you know if you were king for the day or the president for the day when it comes to short-termism the thing that i would do is try to try to restructure the incentives uh not to, you know we talked about the compensation incentives for executives i'd restructure the incentives uh, for investors, I might have a transaction tax, for example. You know, if 70% of, the, uh, if 70 of the, the stock movement every day is being done by computers, and we don't think that that's very helpful, I might say, if you want to buy a stock today because you think Coca-Cola's earnings are going to be great tomorrow and you plan on selling, you know, at 9, you know, 33 after the, uh, the bell opens, after the announcement, Maybe you should pay a 50% tax. Now, by the way, if you truly believe that the stock's going to go up that much, maybe that's a good deal. If you want to hold the stock for a year, maybe we, maybe we charge you less. Uh, if you want to hold the stock for two or three or four years, maybe we charge you less than that. If you want to hold the stock for 10 years, maybe I'll give you a rebate. But I think one of the things we need to think about is how do we incentivize investors to think long term? Because if we can... In, 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 if we can incentivize investors to think long term, we can then really shift the paradigm to make it CEOs and, and board members and managements think long term because everybody will be then uh, thinking, thinking that way. Andrew, is anyone in Washington, to your knowledge, thinking in those terms? There are some. There are some congressmen. There are some senators out there who, who are thinking of these issues. They're not popular. And, you know, uh, I would also... The senators or... Congress no, no, the, the view, issues. this view is not popular, uh, in part because I will also tell you, there are people who would say, uh, you know, the objective journalists would tell you two sides of the story. The other side of the story is that if you are, if you were to tax for it, first of all, there are some people obviously who think taxes tax. unto themselves right. is, 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 is a horrible thing. And, and I understand that view. I, I get it. Um, but beyond that, they'd, they'd say, you know, you, you're going to tax all these different transactions, have some kind of progressive tax. It's going to have all sorts of implications for what they call liquidity in the market. And liquidity has really helped the market because, uh, you know, now if you want to sell your stock at 933, you actually can. Uh, in this new world that I might be creating, you might not be able to find somebody on the other side of that trade who wants, who wants your baseball card, if you know what I mean, at 933. You might have to wait a day or two or a couple hours or not be able to sell $100 worth or 100 shares at one time or whatever. There are real implications. And, and given that we've created a structure around our financial system and how things work, um, there are obviously powers that be uh, that uh, would obviously fight back against that because there are incentives that have already been built into the marketplace to do exactly what we're doing. So every time you want to change any of this, uh, even when you think you're uh, fair-minded and uh, trying, to, trying to do the right thing in good faith, you know, there's always going to be somebody else on the other side who's going to say, you know, that might be a good idea, but by the way, that's going to screw up everything right now. The fan-mindedness, does that ever get in your way as a journalist? I hope not. I try, I try to come to the table with a fair mind uh, as I can every day. Um, so, uh, you know, hope, hopefully, hopefully it doesn't. There are people who agree with me. I, uh, you know, I'll write a column and some, some mornings I'll wake up and I'll get emails that say, you're crazy, you're, you've lost your mind. And then other people will say, you know, I love it. I, I'm thrilled, thrilled you're writing these things. And usually if you actually get, I always say if you get emails on both sides or, or letters from, from people who, who, who are happy and complaining, you're probably doing something right. So. You're glad you're doing this? I can't think of anything better. Really? I, 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 like, I always say, I don't think I've worked a day in my life. This is, you know, this is one of the great jobs in the world. I think finance is, finance has become in many ways the new politics, and it, it you know, I always say follow the money. And when you really think about uh, where the money is and, and what it does to incentivize and motivate and, and 
and, and all of the decisions that are going on in, in our world today, you know, and to be, uh, to be in the middle of it's uh, It's interesting fun. you say you, you contrast, uh, you point out the parallels between finance and politics. Right. Maybe that's our problem. Think of the big problems today oh, 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 in oh, finance oh, By the way, all politics. related. Look, it's Related how? The human spirit, uh, profit-seeking, the ego. Uh, Everything you just said and more. You know, look, it's not just about lobbyists in Washington. That's part of it. But when you really try to understand what motivates people in life, uh, everybody wants to have a, 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 I don't know if everybody, I don't want to generalize, but a good life, they want a house, or this, or this, you know, there's, there's things going on. And so whether they're in Washington um, doing it, you know, they're trying to figure out how am I going to get reelected because I need the job or I need this or I need that. There's a lot going on, I mean, that, that, that's sort of behind the scenes of how all of this uh, happens. And then, by the way, the other thing on top of it, which you may not, uh, which I think people don't always appreciate, now that I spend all this time reporting and covering uh, people who traditionally have a lot of money, um, it's not just that people want to have a good life, they want to be loved. Um, and I think that people want support. And so, you know, right now in a very bifurcated, politically polarized country, it's very difficult for politicians to make decisions, not only because they want to get voted on, but they want to be liked. People want to be liked, whether they have a billion dollars in their, in, in their bank account or, or, or zero. And, and that's, a huge th that's a huge component, I think, of, of the world why. of finance. I think it's about the world of finance. I think it's the world, the world of politics. At that point, we bring our program to an end. And just know what motivates human beings. And I want to thank you so much for joining me again today. Andrew thank you. Sorkin. Appreciate it. And thanks, too, to you in the audience. I hope you join us again next time. And meanwhile, as an old friend used to say, good night and good luck. And do visit the Open Mind website at 13.org slash openmind to reprise this program online right now or to draw upon our archive of 1,500 or so other Open Mind and related programs. That's 13.org slash openmind. Continuing production of The Open Mind has been made possible by grants from the Rosalind P. Walter Foundation, the Bluestein Family Foundation, the Joan Gans Cooney and Peter G. Peterson Fund, Carnegie Corporation of New York, the Malkin Fund, the May and Samuel Rudin Family Foundation, the Joanne and Kenneth Wellner Foundation, the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, and from the corporate community, Mutual of America.